I'm delighted to be here. Uh, thank you very much. Americans are defined by our optimism. We believe in the value of doing our best. And it started with me as a kid, you know, probably like most of us. You get your values instilled with you during early childhood, it gets kind of reinforced growing up in Cub Scouts, this is my mom, Kathy, is a den mother, and it, it, it lasts uh, today, where now as a professor of medicine at the University of Washington, a hematologist, oncologist, and a researcher, it still sticks with me. It's kind of deeply ingrained in, in, in what I do. Uh, and I want to tell you a story about how I believe that what it means to do our best for a patient with cancer is changing in really profound ways. Let me tell you how it was when I started in this field. I came to Seattle 25 years ago to learn a procedure known as bone marrow transplantation. And many of you will know that bone marrow transplantation was developed in Seattle. So unsurprisingly, people with leukemia would flock to Seattle from all over the world. And they're coming to Seattle really for their last best shot at making it through their disease, surviving. And it's kind of, you're all in. We're throwing the kitchen sink at them. Massive doses of chemotherapy and radiation, as much as they could possibly take, pushing them right up to the brink of death and then rescuing them with somebody else's bone marrow and really intensive medical care. It was win or lose, live or die, no middle ground. You don't live with a little bit of leukemia. And 25 years ago, it epitomized what it meant to do our best for patients with cancer. By the early 1990s, I was a uh, beginning attending physician at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And one day, we celebrated the fifth birthday of this little girl. And we were celebrating her birthday in the hospital because her mom was a patient in the hospital. She had a disease called chronic myelogenous leukemia, CML, uh, and she had received a bone marrow transplant. And you don't see her mom in this picture because her mom's taking the picture. And what you therefore also can't see is that her mom's skin color was literally as orange as a pumpkin. She had developed a complication of bone marrow transplantation called graft versus host disease. And she died not long after this picture was taken. Now, as sad as that story is, the real tragedy is that had this little girl's mom developed CML just five years later, she would have received a totally different treatment, a pill that has few side effects, and she very likely would still be alive today. So the lesson is that when it comes to cancer, time matters. My wife, Sibel, who's here in the audience, uh, is a busy oncologist. She works in Puyallup, uh, kind of you know, in the trenches every day, seeing lots of patients. And uh, since I, I see patients a little bit, but mainly I do research, Sibel's seeing lots of patients, we have this amazing collaboration. Now, this, it's, it, it sounds weird, but cancer permeates almost every aspect of our lives. And, and while that might seem depressing, we love it. We, we, this, is what we, this is what we are born to do. And it's a privilege for both of us. And, and about four years ago, after many, many discussions with Sibel, 
I became convinced that our collective approach to cancer needs to be fundamentally rethought. And that really has to do with a single fact. And that's a fact that's become evident in just the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. And it's based on technological advances in DNA sequencing, it doesn't really matter. But the fact is that every cancer is different. Let me say that again. Every cancer that has ever existed is different from every other cancer that has ever existed or ever will exist. And our field is only beginning to come to terms with the profound implications of cancer's uniqueness. Uh, it, so, if, on the other hand, if we were to look at the rate at which technology is improving, it's improving exponentially, explosively. If we were to plot on a graph the rate at which technology is improving, it would be a line that goes up very steeply, and this would be a log axis, so it's exponential growth. On the other hand, if we were to plot the rate at which those technological advances are applied to the treatment of cancer patients, that rate of improvement is linear. And so if we were to place ourselves in the position of a patient with advanced cancer fighting for his or her life, we would be facing an ever-widening gap between what's possible technologically and what's brought to bear in our care. And the grand challenge of our time is to find a way to close that gap. And so toward this end, uh, we've formed something at the University of Washington called the Center for Cancer Innovation. And it's based on a number of big ideas. The first is that no single team of experts has the wherewithal to cure cancer. You have to find teams of experts from many different scientific disciplines to focus their energies on cancer as a problem. And not cancer as this abstract issue, this abstract thought that, oh, it's a concept, but to focus their energies on the problems of an individual patient with cancer. The second thing you have to do is you have to find ways to be able to work with anyone in the world that you want to work with, irrespective of their institutional affiliation. You don't care where they work. If they have the expertise, the knowledge, the technology that could be helpful to your patient, you want to be able to reach out to them. So you have to find a way to transcend institutional boundaries. The next thing, the next idea, is the idea of a cancer patient as a big data problem. Fundamentally, cancer is an information problem. And so that people with expertise in information, there happen to be a lot of people with expertise in information, can bring their skill set to bear on a human being who's fighting for his or her life. And then the next idea is the idea of fusing research and clinical care. Medicine exists in parallel universes, the universe of research and the universe of clinical care. And they're separated by a firewall. And that firewall is there to protect patients who are receiving clinical care from harebrained research ideas that haven't been extensively validated. But we believe that in a patient with advanced cancer who has an incurable disease, that that firewall can block them from accessing the very latest scientific and technical advances that the world has to offer. So, the, so in the clinical trials that are supported by the Center for Cancer Innovation, we remove that firewall and we fuse research and clinical care. And this is exemplified by a, a get-together that Sibel and I had at our house uh, at the end of November uh, and we were really trying to draw in the crowd, so we titled our, our little get-together, Pizza, Beer, and Cancer. <laughs> <laughs> and so this was really a magnet for the nerds. And there are a lot of nerds on this slide. 
people from many different scientific disciplines, computational people, web interface people, uh, statisticians, community oncologists, academic oncologists, trainees, there's even a high school kid here, a Tacoma sophomore who wants to become a cancer researcher. But no team of experts is adequate to the task of fusing research and clinical care. You also need patients who are willing to be the subjects of an unprecedented scientific investigation. And on this slide is Misa Engels, a patient who has the type of breast cancer that we're focused on called metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Our clinical trial goes something like this. We take patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer, it means it's spread, it's it's not generally considered to be curable. And we biopsy their tumor at multiple sites. So we get the tumor wherever we can and safely. We, we subject each bit of tissue to a, a sequencing, collecting from each bit of tissue billions of data points. Digitizing the patient and her tumor, collecting big data, and placing it on the cloud, where we make it accessible to some of the best computational biologists in the world. Ultimately, and soon, we want to make this a subject for crowdsourcing so that any group of brainiacs anywhere in the world can look at this and bring their own novel solution to, their, to trying to figure out what is going on in this patient's cancer. Might we be able to find a point of vulnerability that could be attacked with a targeted drug. And so we take all of that information and we do our best to put it together in the right way. And we test our prediction, not in a Petri dish, not in a lab animal, but in this human being. And we use then what happens to the patient. Does the patient's tumor respond or not? And feed that information back to create a learning loop. And if our predictions are wrong, and we anticipate that sadly they'll be wrong frequently because we're just at the inception of this whole process, we'll again sample the tumor again and take our next best shot. And through this process of what we call intensive longitudinal monitoring with multiple samplings of the tumor at multiple time points over the patient's illness, we will collect an enormous database Rather than looking for a one-size-fits-all treatment for cancer, which we don't believe exists, this idea is all for one, bringing the world's expertise to bear on the problems of an individual cancer patient, and one for all, using that individual patient's experience to teach the world about how cancer works. As we assemble this database in tens, hundreds, and eventually thousands of patients, what we're really aiming for is to create an instruction manual for how cancer works. When I was an intern in the late 80s at Duke, uh, HIV was rampant, and it was always fatal. And around that time, the first effective drug came around. It was called AZT. And we would start the patient on AZT, and you would look at the levels of virus in the blood, and they would plummet, disappear. But then it would come back. And it, when you look at the virus, oh, it's changed in a way to allow it to resist the treatment. So then you try the second generation of treatment. Virus goes away, but then it comes back, having mutated again. Over the decades, we've learned the rules of how HIV evolves and escapes treatment. And today, if you get HIV, you get, a drug, you get drugs that both stop the virus now, but which also block off the anticipated mechanisms of escape. We know what the rules are for HIV. We need this rule book for cancer. So there's another picture, uh, again, of my mom. Uh, Laying, laying in the bed here, uh, the den mother of, of the beginning of my talk. 
And this picture was taken about three weeks ago, the day after she had uh, bilateral mastectomies for a new diagnosis of breast cancer. Cancer feels like a punch that leaves you breathless. And while I've told you, I've given you an intellectual framework for thinking about cancer, on an emotional level, it's extremely scary. And I think back to my patient of 20 years ago and remember the lesson that she taught me that when it comes to cancer, time matters. Let's get going. Thank you.